You are listening to Inside the Black Box. This is the story of CHC Helicopter Service 241. It is just after 11am on the 29th of April 2016. CHC Helicopter Services Flight 241 has just landed on the Gulfax B oil and gas platform in the Norwegian North Sea, about 140 kilometres off the Norwegian coast. The EC-225 Super Puma has been chartered by the National Oil Company of Norway, an operator of the oil and gas platform, Statoil. Today, CHC Helicopter Service 241 is undertaking a shuttle service from the heliport at Bergen, which lies about 180 kilometres to the southeast of the platform. Helicopters play an essential part in the North Sea oil industry, enabling offshore workers to quickly get from heliports onshore to offshore installations, as well as quickly transporting vital components and undertaking search and rescue missions. In a given year, Helicopters in the North Sea facilitate approximately 2 million passenger journeys. However, the mode of transport is not without its risks. There have been numerous accidents, ditchings, and even crashes involving helicopters in the North Sea, leading to loss of life. CHC has been tasked with ferrying employees of Statoil and their subcontractors to and from the Gulfax oil field. The pilots have already completed one round trip this morning to the neighbouring Gulfax C platform. Now, having landed on Gulfax B, and with the aircraft's rotors still turning, the arriving personnel disembark the aircraft, along with their baggage and miscellaneous cargo. They are replaced by 11 passengers, who are leaving the platform and heading back to Bergen. Ten Norwegians and one Scotsman. The passengers climb aboard in their distinctive brightly coloured survival suits. These suits are designed to extend the survival time of the passengers and crew in the event the helicopter should have to ditch in the lethally cold North Sea. Today, the EC-225 is commanded by Michel Vimerchatti, aged 44, an Italian with 6,000 hours flight experience. His co-pilot is Norwegian native Olav Bastiansen, aged 57, with 11,000 hours flight experience. The co-pilot, Bastiansen, will be flying the return leg to Bergen. Twelve minutes after touching down on the Gulfax B platform, the crew transfer is complete and the aircraft's doors are closed. At 11.16, the EC-225 Super Puma, with call sign HKS-241, lifts off from the Gulfax B oil platform. The aircraft begins climbing to its cruising altitude, while tracking towards Bergen. Four minutes later, the aircraft levels off at 3,000 feet. Over the next 30 minutes, the Super Puma makes its way towards the Norwegian mainland, travelling at approximately 140 knots. At 11.46, the aircraft has almost reached the Norwegian coast, and the co-pilot, Bastiansen, makes contact with the airport at Bergen, advising them of their current altitude. The helicopter is instructed by air traffic control to head for a navigation waypoint approximately 15 kilometres northwest of the airport. The co-pilot requests ILS Y17. For the heliport at Bergen, ILS Y17 is the helicopter landing approach using the airport's instrument landing system on runway 17. A few minutes later, HKS-241 is given clearance for landing via ILS Y17 and further clearance to descend to 2,000 feet. The aircraft is put into a standard descent of about 500 feet per minute. As HKS-241 proceeds towards the waypoint while descending, The radar air traffic controller contacts the aircraft to advise them of a new QNH figure. QNH indicates the atmospheric pressure at sea level. It is essential information for pilots 
since the correct figure is required to know the altitude above sea level. The co-pilot acknowledges the new QNH as the aircraft continues its descent. At just before 11.53, HKS-241 levels off at 2,000 feet, still heading towards the navigation beacon. Two minutes later, the aircraft is approaching the small island of Turoi, which has a population of approximately 100 people and is connected to the Norwegian mainland by the Turoi Bridge. A family is walking west along the bridge towards Turoi. The family hear the familiar sound of an approaching helicopter coming towards them from the northwest. They are not initially interested. To the population of Turoi, the sound of helicopters heading to and from Bergen is a common occurrence to them because of the Norwegian oil industry. As they continue walking, the husband catches sight of a helicopter breaking through cloud cover and travelling towards them. It is HKS-241. Suddenly, the family hear a loud rattling sound and a bang, which was later likened to selecting the wrong gear in a car. Upon hearing this sound, the husband stops and watches the helicopter as his wife and child keep walking across the bridge. As the aircraft travels towards him at 140 knots, he sees the top rotor of the aircraft begin to shake. Suddenly, the rotor snaps free from the helicopter. As the rotor separates from the aircraft, HKS-241 begins to tumble from the sky. The aircraft, travelling above the bridge, hurtles over the man's head, rolling upside down on its own axis. The family, hearing pieces of debris raining down into the water and onto the bridge itself, hurry to the other side to safety. The helicopter is yawing from side to side and completely out of control. The EC-225 falls in a ballistic arc with its nose pitching further and further down. Thirteen seconds after the first sign of trouble, the aircraft, falling nose first, smashes into the edge of a small rocky island at an almost vertical attitude. The aircraft disintegrates on impact. After striking the rocks on the edge of the island, the wreckage continues to be propelled forward and slides into the sea. A cloud of white fuel vapour rises up from the wreckage, which quickly catches fire, igniting the heather on the island. The rotor, which had detached from the aircraft, is still airborne, spinning rapidly. First it travels in the same direction as the helicopter, heading towards the bridge, before suddenly changing course and heading north. The rotor would eventually land about 500 metres from where it had initially detached, on a different island. The air traffic controllers observing HKS-241's progress at Bergen hear unusual sounds on the frequency the aircraft was broadcasting on. For a period of 13 seconds, they hear what sounds like somebody broadcasting on the frequency without saying anything before this is abruptly cut short. Adding to their concern, the label of CHC Helicopter Service 241 disappears from their radar scopes. At 11.56, the air traffic controllers request a nearby Norwegian Coast Guard helicopter, call sign Midnight One, to survey the area. A minute later, Midnight One reports that they have spotted smoke in the area. Air Traffic Control notifies the Joint Rescue Coordination Centre for Southern Norway. In parallel, local residents contact emergency services. The first boat to attempt rescue arrives at the scene at 12.01, only six minutes after the aircraft has crashed. It is clear straight away that rescue services are not required. The 11 passengers and two crew members of CHC Helicopter Service 241 are dead. The fire services work to extinguish a fire which has developed on the island as a consequence of the crash and recover the bodies of the passengers and crew. The Accident Investigation Board for Norway, or AIBN, is responsible for investigating transportation accidents within Norway 
much in the same way as the NTSB has this responsibility in the United States. Their investigators arrived on the scene on the evening of the accident. Once the bodies have been recovered, the task of recovering the wreckage can begin. As discussed before, after impacting the ground, the majority of the wreckage slid off the rocky island into the sea below, coming to rest about five metres below the surface. The day after the accident, the main wreckage was pulled from the sea using a crane. Still attached to the wreckage was the helicopter's combined cockpit voice and digital flight data recorder. While the majority of the wreckage was located beside the island, given the helicopter's rotor separated about 500 metres from where it finally crashed, the search area is significant. The investigators divide the area into grid squares. On shore, metal detectors were used to identify any significant pieces of wreckage. In the water, divers and remotely operated vehicles undertook hundreds of expeditions. They worked through the deep kelp forest which lay on the seabed to try and identify any parts of the helicopter which could aid in understanding what had happened. This kelp forest proved very difficult to penetrate, however, so an alternative method was trialled. A Norwegian company built a raft with three rows of powerful magnets attached to the bottom. This was then towed behind a boat. As the magnetic barge was towed over the kelp, pieces of metallic wreckage would be attracted to the magnets. Using this method, investigators were able to find hundreds of small pieces of debris in the thick kelp which lay on the seabed and which might otherwise have been undiscovered. Upon studying the aircraft's combined cockpit voice and digital flight data recorder, the investigators were disappointed to find that the recording had cut out only one second after the first sign of any problems. The aircraft's black boxes are designed to record the events leading up to an accident. Once they have reached their storage capacity, the boxes will overwrite the older data. Therefore, if an aircraft was to crash but still had power to the black boxes, the relevant data could potentially be lost as it was overwritten before the boxes were discovered. To counter this, the black boxes are fitted with a switch which cuts power once a certain level of g-force has been experienced by the aircraft. Normally this sudden increase in g-forces coincides with an aircraft impacting the ground and the end of the accident sequence. Unfortunately, the rotor had separated from the aircraft with such severity that the switches had been triggered before the aircraft impacted the ground. This led to the CVR and FDR losing power and failing to record the final 13 seconds of the flight. There was, however, data for the previous flights the aircraft had undertaken up until the time of the accident. What was disturbing was that there had been absolutely no warning of an impending problem until one second before the recording ended, when a grinding noise could be heard in the cockpit voice recorder and a warning chime began, which was cut silent. The pilots had no time to react to the impending problem and could have done nothing to prevent the accident and save the aircraft. It was clear why the helicopter had crashed. The main rotor had detached from the aircraft. For a helicopter, this is catastrophic and is the equivalent to an aeroplane losing its wings. The rotors on a helicopter are essentially a number of small wings, just like on an aeroplane. Instead of an aircraft moving forward through the air in order to generate lift like an aeroplane, the wings of the helicopter themselves are rotated through the air while the helicopter remains stationary. But with these rotors gone, the aircraft will no longer generate any lift and the helicopter will fall from the sky. While it was easy to understand what had caused HKS-241 to plummet to Earth, the question became, what caused the rotors to detach in such a catastrophic fashion? the AIBN identified three causes, or failure modes, which could lead to the rotor blades and mast separating from the helicopter. They are damage to the rotor's suspension bars, destruction of the conical housing just below the aircraft's rotor, 
and damage to the aircraft's gearbox. The parts of these components that had been successfully recovered were sent to Norway's defence laboratories for metallurgical analysis. The first failure mode considered was the failure of the rotor's suspension bars. These bars suspend the rotor assembly but also transmit the lift forces generated by the rotors to the body of the aircraft. Upon examination of the suspension bars, however, the investigators discovered that the fittings which attached the bars to the helicopter failed due to overload. This meant that they were intact and functioning as designed up until the separation of the rotor. In other words, the destruction of the suspension bars was a consequence of some other failure, not the main failure itself. The investigators next looked at the top of the housing for the helicopter's gearbox, known as the conical housing. This large piece of aluminium, which covered the top of the aircraft's gearbox, had completely shattered. However, it was determined that this conical housing had been destroyed as a consequence of the rotor detaching. In addition, the bolt holes which had secured the conical housing had been elongated in the direction the rotor had been travelling. Once again, this showed that the housing had been torn apart as a consequence of something else. Finally, the investigators looked at the aircraft's gearbox. The Super Puma is equipped with two Safran Makila 2A turboshaft engines. These are jet engines, but unlike in a commercial airliner, they are not designed to produce thrust. This engine is designed to turn something, in this case, the aircraft's rotors. The two jet engines rotate at around 23,000 rpm. This speed is much too fast to turn the aircraft's rotors. This is where the EC-225's gearbox comes in. The Super Puma's gearbox is known as a reduction gearbox in that it is designed to reduce the speed of the engines to a useful rotational speed. The first stage of the gearbox, known as the main gearbox, takes the rotation from the shafts of the two engines and reduces the speed to about 2,400 rpm and converts the horizontal direction of the engine rotation into a vertical direction so it can travel up to the rotor. 2,400 rpm is still too fast, so another gearbox is required, known as the epicyclic module. This part of the gearbox uses a two-stage planetary gear set. The planetary gear set consists of three types of gears. In the EC-225, the driven gear, coming from the first stage of the gearbox, is the central gear. This is known as the sun gear. Around the sun gear in a circle sit eight smaller gears, known as planet gears. These planet gears are linked together by the planet gear carrier, which sits above all of the planet gears and sun gear. The final component of the planetary gear set is the ring gear, which surrounds the planet gears and in the EC-225 is fixed and stationary. The sun gear, driven by the aircraft's engines and the gearbox below, turns, which causes the planet gears to spin and to orbit around the sun gear, hence the name planetary gear set. The rotation of the planet gears around the sun gear is slower than the speed of the sun gear itself. This is how the planetary gear set slows the high-speed rotation. The top of the planet gear carrier holds yet another sun gear, which forms part of a second planetary gear set, sitting on top of the first. After travelling through the two gear sets, the rotational speed has been reduced to only 265 rpm. The final output is then transferred up to the rotor itself. The metallurgical report drew attention to two pieces of a fractured gear. These two pieces made up about half of one of the planetary gears, which was in the second stage of the module. Scoring on the pieces of the gear suggested that the two segments had separated while the other planetary gear and sun gear had been rotating. The metallurgists looked at the points where the gear had fractured. There are two pieces, so in all there are four fracture points. As the metallurgists looked at these surfaces, 
they noted that three of the fracture surfaces had been caused by overload. In other words, they had been destroyed by the forces acting upon them during the crash. But the fourth surface crack looked like it had been caused by fatigue. The metallurgists used a combination of CT scans and X-rays to look more closely at the area of the fatigue crack. Below the surface, they found out much more about the fatigue crack which appeared to have taken place. In order for the planetary gear to roll smoothly on the gear carrier, rollers are put between the space in the middle of the planetary gear and the carrier itself. These work in the same way as ball bearings and help reduce friction between the two surfaces. The investigators were able to determine a number of stages which help explain what had happened to the planetary gear and its effect on HKS 241. As the gear is turning, the rollers on the inside of the planetary gear make contact with the gear's inner surface. The rollers apply a very high level of pressure to the inside surface of the gear as it passes over it. At some point, a tiny piece of debris becomes stuck between the roller and the gear. This caused the roller to become scratched and led to friction between the bearing and the gear itself. Gradually, over time, this led to small indentations becoming present on the inner surface of the gear, called micro-pits. The rollers continued to act on this uneven surface, and over time, this led to a phenomenon known as spalling. Small flakes of metal began to be ejected from the inner surface of the bearing. With repeated pressure from the rollers constantly coming into contact with the spall area, these small indentations develop into cracks. Over time, these cracks travelled through the material of the gear and finally merged together. Eventually, the crack broke through the outer surface of the gear, beside the teeth, causing it to split. The split of this small gear was catastrophic for the aircraft's gearbox. The gear breaking in two caused the teeth of the planetary gear to clash with teeth on the sun gear. This led to the entire module which had been rotating at hundreds of revolutions per minute, to suddenly seize. But power from the aircraft's engines and the first stage of the gearbox was still being transmitted up the drivetrain, and the inertia of the aircraft's rotor, which was still acting from above, put enormous strain on the epicyclic module. This caused the planetary gears to break apart, and then the outer ring gear to be deformed. Unable to withstand the stresses acting upon it, the ring gear shattered, ejecting the broken planetary gears out of the gearbox. At the same time, the conical housing which formed part of the top of the gearbox also disintegrated. The rotor was now loose and free to move around. At this stage, all that was supporting the rotor were the three suspension bars. As the rotor flailed about, an erratic movement caused the suspension bars to finally be sheared off and the rotor tore itself from the aircraft. Only 260 hours had passed since the entire gearbox had been replaced, so questions were raised about the gearbox and the parts contained within it. There were a number of potential causes of damage to the planetary gear, which the AIBN considered. The major cause of damage which the AIBN concentrated on was the type of planet gear used in the accident. While Airbus designed and manufactured the gear itself, the inner surface of the gear and the gear's rollers were completed by two different suppliers, FAG and NTN-SNR. While the roller parts were listed as interchangeable, they actually had different design properties depending on which company manufactured them. The FAG rollers, which were present on the accident aircraft, were designed in such a way that they applied greater force to the surface of the planetary gear while turning. When compared to the rollers manufactured by NTN-SNR, gears which had been finished by FAG showed significantly greater levels of micro-pitting. They were also noted as having a lower service life. This was despite the fact that both parts were considered interchangeable. The AIBN believed this factor could have been instrumental in the swift degradation of the planetary gear, which would eventually crack. <laughs>
Another potential initiating factor related to an incident the gearbox had been involved in one year earlier. In March 2015, the gearbox was being transported by road in rural Australia on the back of a flatbed truck. In an effort to avoid a herd of kangaroos on the road, the truck had swerved, causing it to come off the road and roll upside down. The gearbox, which was being transported in an approved shipping container, fell out of its box and onto the ground. Despite damage to the container, there was very little damage apparent to the gearbox itself. Nevertheless, it was transported to Airbus helicopters in France for further inspection and repair. Airbus undertook an inspection of the gearbox, including all components in the epicyclic module. No problems were detected with the gearbox and it was returned to CHC, with no parts replaced. CHC would then install this gearbox on the accident aircraft. The AIBN stated that there was insufficient evidence to prove that the abnormal shock loads on the gearbox during the transportation accident led to the gearbox failure. However, both the European Aviation Safety Agency, responsible for regulating aviation in Europe, and Airbus disagree with this. It seemed inconceivable that there could be no warning to the crew before such a catastrophic failure of the aircraft's gearbox. Indeed, the EC-225 was fitted with a number of systems in order to give the pilots prior warning of a failure of the gearbox. The Super Puma is equipped with a system called HUMS. HUMS is an abbreviation for Health and Usage Monitoring System. 25 accelerometers are fitted at various points across the aircraft. These accelerometers are designed to monitor the levels of vibration in different components of the aircraft, including the gearbox itself. The data which the system gathers is downloaded once the aircraft is on the ground and passed through software by engineering personnel. The personnel study the data for any indication of wear and take remediation actions that might be necessary. Unfortunately, there are two problems with this system. The first is that the system provides no real-time warning of damage to the gearbox. The data must be downloaded and analysed on the ground before any indication of an issue can be identified. The second is the problem of monitoring multiple planet gears individually spinning within a casing. It is difficult to place the accelerometer close enough to the gears themselves to detect any abnormal vibration. The data card was recovered from the wreckage, and so the investigators were able to access all data for the flights that had taken place the day of the accident. They also used historical HUMS data, in total looking at about 150 hours of flight time for the same helicopter before the accident. They found no indication of any vibration within the gearbox. In other words, the system had been completely useless in indicating any degradation of the gearbox. Airbus, the aircraft's manufacturer, admitted that the main detection methods of issues with the epicyclic gearbox would be with the use of the gearbox's chip detection system. Unlike with HUMS, which could provide information on gearbox wear only after the EC-225 had completed its flight. The chip detection system could provide real-time warnings to the pilots of potential gearbox failure. Magnetic plugs are inserted into various points around the gearbox body. On the end of the magnetic plug is a sensor. The sensor component is really just an open circuit. If a metallic chip or a number of metallic chips of sufficient size are attracted to and accumulate on the face of the plug, they bridge the gap in the circuit, and a warning will be activated in the aircraft's cockpit. The chip detectors are also periodically removed and inspected by ground personnel. At the time, maintenance procedures required that if a total of 50 square millimetres of material was discovered on the detectors, that the gearbox should be removed and inspected. The gap in the circuit on the chip detection sensor was only 2.28 millimetres, meaning only a very small chip should be required to activate the detector. 
The investigators believe that a total of 28 square millimetres of material had been released from the inner surface of the gear before the gearbox's failure. This should have meant that more than enough material had been released to activate one of the sensors. So why was no warning given to the pilots? The answer here is twofold. First, Airbus had assumed that there would be a fairly significant level of spalling should there be any issue with one of the planetary gears. At the time of the accident, the understanding was that cracks in the planetary gear itself would be preceded by significant particles coming loose from the gear and being detected. In the case of HKS-241, there was only very limited spalling, and not much material was released. Additionally, Airbus had estimated that the detection capability of the chip detectors in the aircraft's gearbox were only about 12% efficient. Based on this efficiency, pieces larger than either the 28 square millimetres that was believed to have been released from the failed planet gear, or even the 50 square millimetre requirement, would need to have come loose before the gearbox would have been removed and inspected. Alternatively, a significant piece of debris would have had to come loose and stuck to the chip detector during the accident flight to give the pilots prior warning. The gearbox which had failed on HKS-241 had only very recently been installed, following its refurbishment after the incident in Australia. One would imagine that the disaster of CHC Helicopter Service 241 would be a turning point for safety changes on the EC-225 Super Puma, particularly changes in design to the gearbox. But in reality, that turning point should have come six years prior. An accident with almost identical circumstances had befallen another Super Puma helicopter. Just as with HKS-241, Bond offshore helicopters 85N had been returning from an offshore platform, only this time it had been returning to Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. The helicopter in this case was an Airbus AS332, a slightly smaller version of the EC-225 involved in the incident in Norway. In the exact same way as would happen in the Norwegian incident, a planetary gear on the second stage of the helicopter's epicyclic module failed, causing the gearbox to seize and the aircraft's rotor to tear free. The aircraft plunged into the North Sea, killing all 16 aboard. As this accident was in the United Kingdom's jurisdiction, the investigation was headed by the Air Accident Investigation Branch. While investigators were not able to determine the exact sequence which caused the gear to disintegrate because crucial parts of the failed gear were not able to be found, the conclusions were similar to those for the crash of CHC Helicopter Service 241. While not able to find a missing piece of the crucial gear which had shattered, British investigators created a simulation of how they believed the crack in the gear would propagate, based on the information available. The path which this crack would take, and the subsequently predicted fractured gear segment, bore striking similarities to the fractured piece found on the Norwegian helicopter. Perhaps most importantly, the Bond offshore helicopter's 85N disaster showed the effect of a catastrophic gearbox failure on the Super Puma it led to the loss of a rotor. The major recommendation of the Air Accident Investigation Branch following the Bond offshore helicopters accident fell with the European Aviation Safety Agency, which performs a similar function in Europe that the FAA provides in the US. The Air Accident Investigation Branch recommended that the European Aviation Safety Agency evaluate whether the Super Puma series of helicopters still met airworthiness requirements following the destruction of the aircraft's gearbox and subsequent detachment of the main rotors. The EASA and Airbus helicopters together undertook a detailed review of the gearbox's design. The EASA would eventually respond to the AAIB's report, stating that the interpretation of the evidence following the Bond offshore helicopters accident and the service experience with the gearbox did not point to its design being defective. The aircraft would be permitted to continue flying. The other major recommendation was that Airbus work to develop further methods to identify gearbox degradation. Airbus did remove a ring of magnets 
from within the gearbox which acted as a particle trap for potential debris and implemented a more intensive inspection regime. However, even after these improvements and subsequent testing, it was at this point that Airbus determined that its chip detection system was now 12% efficient. Airbus classed this as sufficient to detect classical surface spalling in sufficient time to take remedial action. The actions taken by either Airbus or the EASA were insufficient to prevent another rotor loss in the case of HKS-241. The AIBN actually looked at how the Super Puma had been certified as airworthy in the first place, given the failure of one component could lead to the destruction of the aircraft. In the failure mode, effects and criticality analysis document prepared in assessing the planetary gear, failure was identified as catastrophic, but noted as extremely improbable, so no prevention measures were required. One of the compensating factors given to mitigate the risk was emergency procedures. However, two accidents have now shown that no emergency procedure can save the aircraft in the event of the epicyclic module becoming jammed. Again, the main line of defence for the aircraft was the ability to detect fatigue in the components and was to be achieved through chip detection due to spalling. There was no contingency for such an event as in Norway, where very limited spalling was released from the gear. Following the HKS-241 incident, in June 2016, the EC-225, an AS-332 Super Puma series of helicopters, was grounded by the EASA across Europe. The EASA lifted the ban on Super Puma flights in October 2016, with a number of conditions. This included halving the surface life of the planetary gears, 10-hourly inspections of the chip detectors, and 100-hourly inspections of the aircraft's gearbox oil. Despite this endorsement by the EASA, the UK and Norway, the largest users of the Super Puma in Europe, would keep the aircraft grounded until July 2017. But the damage to the Super Puma's reputation in the oil and gas industry in general, and in the North Sea in particular, was already complete. Not only had the aircraft suffered two catastrophic rotor separations in the North Sea sector, in its service life it had also suffered several forced ditchings, of which some had led to fatalities. Its reputation among the personnel who worked offshore and were forced to travel on it was very poor. One survey conducted in January 2017, before the proposed return to flight in the North Sea sector, stated two-thirds of workers would not board the aircraft. Even after both the UK and Norwegian aviation authorities have permitted the return to service of the Super Puma, at the time of recording, neither the AS-332 or EC-225 is being operated in the North Sea. There is no indication this will change. The Sikorsky S-92 is now the dominant aircraft in the North Sea making up two-thirds of all passenger flights in 2017. In a restructure following bankruptcy almost immediately after the loss of HKS-241, CHC Helicopters was able to return its fleet of Super Pumas to Airbus by cancelling its leases on the aircraft. For other operators of the Super Puma, with reduced demand in the North Sea, some helicopters have been sold to the military, Others have been repurposed for firefighting duties. Many now sit mothballed, waiting on a customer. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of Inside the Black Box. Please be sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at ITBB Podcast. That's India Tango Bravo Bravo Podcast. Thank you for your continued support and patience while this episode was created.